Really excited to be um, chairing this panel because one of the things that really struck me uh, is how important it is that people actually do things. And there's lots of policies out there and lots of grand ideas, especially in open access, where we say, oh, the world will be a better place if it's open access. But where's the proof? And, 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 we, and people have really got to do things. And there's, there's, so to be part of a panel here where people are doing things, eh? and be, then to follow that up to say, we've all got to be able to reference that. And we've got to be able to say, look, those people are doing it, and that's how they're doing it. And that's going to be really important for driving policy through and, and, and change through as well. So I'm really, really excited to be um, that this panel has come together as it has. Uh, and so first up, we've got Alison uh, Muddit, from the, who's the director of the University of California Press. Um, and they've, as I'm sure people are, are well aware, launching lots of new initiatives for open journals and open books. And she's going to tell us all about it. So thank you very much. I should actually just quickly add, the, the sort of thought was that we would try just having questions at the end rather than after each session. So we'll have uh, each of the three people, and of course, if somebody's got a burning question, you know, um, uh, please uh, do so. But otherwise, we could keep it open for a bit more discussion and, and, and general discussion later on rather than each time. Okay, Alison. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here to talk about um, what we're doing at UC Press. So. We spent a lot of time this morning talking about science and about journals in particular, and both those things are extremely important and have made great strides, as we heard this morning, towards open access. But I'm going to spend a little bit more time this afternoon talking about the humble monograph. Um, I assume that with a room full of librarians, we've probably got a good number of humanists in the room as well. Um, so it's an opportunity for us to think really about the different challenges of moving both books and fields that don't have extensive research funding to an open access model. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking briefly about sort of how UC Press came to open access and where it fits in. I'm going to talk very briefly about our open access journal program, Collabora, as there are one or two things I wanted to highlight there. But as I said, I'm really going to focus primarily on, on the monograph. So we launched both of these programs a year ago. Um, the idea of open access had been sort of germinating at UC Press for a number of years. When I took over as director five years ago, even then, um, I was sort of somewhat dismayed at the general engagement of the university press community with open access, given our sort of shared missions of dissemination and adding impact to scholarship, um, it seemed to me that there was a really important role that we could be playing. So we really sort of got going a couple of years ago in thinking about open access and um, uh, just a year ago launched both of these programs. So before going into um, the programs themselves, I just want to talk a little bit about you know, what we saw as the landscape for open access as we started thinking about what the opportunities for UC Press might be in this world. The first was thinking about you know, what has open access achieved so far? And so I think, you know, as we heard this morning, there are some really tangible um, achievements of open access over the last sort of 10, 15 years. There have been a wide range of mandates established across North America and Europe. There have been a significant growth in open access publications, both fully open access and growth of hybrid journal models. Um, there have been more flexible licensing terms from publishers um, to enable compliance with those mandates. And to some extent, there's been a moderation of price increases from the traditional publishers. How much of that is driven by market conditions rather than OA, I think, is, is arguable, but that's certainly been the case. But we've still got a long way to go. Um, open access isn't yet dominated by the traditional publishers, largely thanks, I think, in, to the sheer number of papers that go to the Public Library of Science at this point. Uh, but there's a real danger that we're starting to see open access become sort of um, taken over by the larger publishers. You only have to look at the share of, fu of funding that is going um, from traditional fundings like the, the Wellcome Trust, for example, to a publisher like Elsevier to see that they're actually doing pretty well out of um, open access. I think we're going to see a moderation of that. There's some interesting work going on. We heard a little bit about it this morning. Um, there's a great project um, being undertaken by Mackenzie Smith and Ivy Anderson at the UC, their Pay It Forward project, that's really looking at this sort of issue of cost of publication. And I think you know that's going to become a bigger issue over the next couple of years. Um, but at this point, we're still seeing sort of pretty high charges. 
For us as a university press, I think this last point here about the engagement of the scholars themselves was a really interesting and important one. For whatever reason, the vast majority of scholars in all fields, certainly in humanities and social sciences, but I think arguably across the sciences as well, the majority have either actively chosen not to engage with or have just shown a sort of pretty much a disinterest in inertia when it comes to open access. And there are those of us who can sit around and say, well, they should do it because it's the right thing to do. But I think if we really want to get open access to move further forward than it is right now, we really all collectively, whether publishers, librarians, or other different groups, have to find a way to really engage the faculty. And I think that really comes down to understanding more about their motivations when they publish. So as we thought about what we wanted to do, um, you know, we started with our mission statement, and you can see a few extracts here, but you can see that dissemination is kind of at the heart of what we do. You know, as a publisher, our pricing strategy has always been pretty moderate. Um, on the journal side, we have less invested in the traditional model, if you like. We have a smaller portfolio, so the risks of flipping um, that portfolio were lower. Um, but really, I think what was driving it was our commitment to, to dissemination and to not just dissemination, but to actually really creating an impact for the scholarship that we publish. So we started with a pretty blank slate as we started thinking about open access and what we wanted to do here, and really tried to think about, you know, if we were redesigning a system of scholarly communication from the ground up at this point, where would we start? So we started with a handful of basic principles. Um, the first was that whatever we did needed to meet the needs of the most important stakeholders, and those were the producers of content, in other words, the researchers and the authors, the readers of content, the consumers, and then the people who pay for the content, typically the librarians when we're talking about monographs and journals. Secondly, it had to be self-sustaining. So the idea of a model um, that really couldn't cover its costs over the long term really wasn't going to work. And beyond that, we also needed it to be something that could generate a little extra surplus so it could go back into reinvesting um, to move forward. And we also wanted to build on existing open access models that were already out there. So really, really tried to adopt this sort of community-focused approach and being very transparent about pricing. You can go and look at either of the websites for our programs and see exactly where the numbers come from and how the money is spent. And so we felt that as a not-for-profit organization, we had this sort of unique opportunity to create what I'd call a sort of partially subsidized model um, to move this forward. So let me talk a little bit about Calabra, which is our open access um, journal program. You may not be able to read all the detail on the slide, but I'll give you the website details at the end. You can go and take a look there. But what we were trying to do here was to address some of the principal concerns we hold, heard from stakeholders. Um, we did a lot of this work through both sort of substantial surveys of a couple of thousand faculty across North America and Europe, um, and also a lot of focus groups and more informal discussions on campus. And so the two biggest concerns um, that we heard were around the overall level of APCs and about the discrepancies in funding across fields and how fields that didn't have those nice NEH grants or N <laughs> not NEH, sorry, NIH grants um, were, were going to publish. So we came up with this model where we've got a, a pretty low cost of, pub of APC at $875. But I think there are sort of two linked and unique components about what we're trying to do with Calabra. Um, both of which are sort of trying to sort of shift and sort of accelerate the mood towards open access across fields. So the first is that we pay reviewers for their reviewing activity. It's deliberately paid on activity and not on acceptance or rejection so that there's no bias um, in, the, in the review process itself. Um, it's not, uh, we're not able to compensate them at a rate that fully compensates them for the time that they spent on it. So typically the payment is around sort of $60, $70 per review. Um, but really what we were trying to do here is to address this sort of oft-raised criticism in scholarly publishing that the value only flows towards publishers and none of it flows back into the research community. So by assigning a certain value to the review process, we're, what we are then able to do is to sort of flow that back into, into the community. Now, review, sorry, reviewers have two, three options as to what they can do with, with that funding. The first is they can just take a check, and so they can be paid. And the second two ways are two different ways of, if you like, paying forward um, the, the amount that they've generated. 
Firstly, they can donate it to the Calabra waiver fund. So we have a waiver fund that is for um, faculty who are, for whatever reason, unable to pay the cost of publication themselves. And the second is that they can pay it into their institution's open access fund. So that isn't purely to support publishing in Calabra. It's this notion of supporting more open access publishing wherever it happens to be. And the idea with the Calabra waiver fund is that that enables us to fund publishing in fields that don't have the research grants. So we deliberately launch Calabra in a broad range of fields, life sciences, environmental sciences, and then social science, to see if we could test out this notion of sort of flowing funding from one set of fields to another. It's pretty early days at this point. We've just published 15 articles. Um, but it's great to see that 100% of reviewers at this point have decided to um, pay it forward and to donate their, their fee. So this brings us on to um, the monograph. And uh, as I was sitting listening to all of the discussions about science and so on this morning, it kind of really brought home the sort of differences that we see um, when we look at um, the monograph and the, the challenges here. When we thought about monographs as a university press and sort of embedded in humanities and social science fields, you know, we recognize that the monograph remains a critically important vehicle for scholarly communication in these fields but one for which the traditional models are increasingly unsustainable. And although some of the new sort of access and purchase options like short-term loan and demand-driven acquisition may have eased the burden for libraries, they've only increased the burden for university presses. So we were really interested in sort of thinking about ways to not only sort of create a sort of survival mechanism for the monograph, but to think about how we might be able to reinvigorate it through open digital models. And so we really believed that we had to sort of start by understanding the challenges of, of the community. So the first thing I'd like to highlight is the unique dual role that the monographs plays in, uh, in scholarship in these fields. Um, of course, primar primarily, it's a vehicle for sustained thought about a particular scholarly argument that becomes the building block of scholarship in those fields. But it's also a critical marker of academic achievement for faculty in those fields, and one that plays a critical role in um, the promotion and tenure options for faculty in those fields. So as we started to talk to faculty, there was a, you know, a really critical concern about whether an open access and digital monograph would count um, in the same way that a traditional monograph does. The second thing that you find in these fields are some pretty significant cultural challenges. And I think you know what you again, in comparison with some of the fields we were talking about this morning, these are fields that remain deeply invested in what I would call the slow form of knowledge making that the monograph represents, very different um, to um, a journal article in that sense. And so not least of these is this cultural attachment to print, but it's not, I think it goes beyond a cultural attachment. Um, Jeff Krosick in his uh, report last year for the Higher Education Council, uh, Higher Education Funding Council in England, talked about the visual grammar of the book as being critical to readership and comprehension, and it's something that really isn't well replicated yet by technology. And so I think collectively, uh, these factors help to explain why monograph publishing has remained pretty conservative up until this point, and sadly, largely untouched by the opportunities that are presented by sort of network digital information systems. And I think importantly as well, um, one of the things I've come to realize is that the, the challenges are heightened by the fact that we are trying to move to digital and open access simultaneously. And if you think about journals, the move to digital had been achieved long before we really started to sort of talk seriously about open access. And so, you know, the result of this is that I see a lot of conflation um, among faculty about things like peer review and so on and digital and not really understanding um, the difference between what I think of as entirely separate constructs. And that came across very clearly as we talked to faculty. So again, we did some extensive surveying. Um, we talked to a lot of faculty on campuses. And these were really the kind of concerns um, that we heard. This was pretty true across disciplines and across um, geographic reg regions as we looked into this. So you know, as I noted, one of the critical issues is this sort of lack of understanding of what open access is and what digital publishing is. Of course, one of the, the biggest, um, I think, misunderstandings here was around peer review, and that open access meant that there was either no peer review or poor peer review. 
Um, perhaps not surprisingly, the biggest concern in these fields would, um, that really don't have any funding at all um, in the, for the most cases, how do we pay for it? And because the dominant gold and hybrid models for open access have been developed for STEM fields with substantial grant funding, it's unclear how that would translate um, to books into these fields. So here in brief is kind of the model that we developed for Luminous. And I think the, the best way to kind of think about the financial model um, at this point in time is sort of as almost a crowdfunded model. Um, what we were trying to address here was, you know, there's, there's sort of core facts that the m current model is increasingly unsustainable, both for libraries and for presses. But secondly, this issue of access. As a university press, we have a real commitment to giving access as far as we can, ideally to everybody who is interested in and or would benefit from the scholarship itself. And that certainly extends well beyond the two or three hundred research libraries that can afford to buy monographs these days. So at the same time, we wanted to make sure that we really sort of retained all that was valuable about the monograph. At this point in time, there really isn't a single source to go to for funding open access monographs. And so that's really why we, we developed the model that we have here, trying to bring in the different stakeholders who have an interest in maintaining monographs for the long run. So the, you know, one of the things that we've been doing over the last five years since I joined UC Press was really focusing on becoming more cost efficient as we could. And so we have d sort of driven down our baseline cost for monograph publication here to $15,000. Now that still sounds like a lot of money to most humanists who don't have funding, but if you look at the recent report that came out from Ithaca just a few weeks ago about the average cost of producing a monograph, um, that cost was somewhere around $30,000. So we feel pretty good about the number that we have here, um, and we continue to work to think about ways in which we can sort of drive that down over time. So there are four real sources of support here. The first is from UC Press in continuing to cover the indirect overheads. Um, the second is revenue from print sales. I'll talk a little bit more about what we've seen there in a minute. Um, the third is a subsidy that comes from library support, and again, I'll come on to that in a minute. And so that then leaves um, the remaining amount that is covered in what we're calling the author's institutional contribution. Um, that's deliberately to signal that our assumption is that this comes from the institution and not from the individual author. Um, but of course, there isn't a single place for that to, to come from at this point, so that is, that is indeed one of the challenges. I thought I would share a little bit more about the library model, given that I'm here with a room of librarians. So the idea here is we have four different uh, membership levels for libraries, one th starting at $1,000, going as $5,000, $10,000, and $20,000 a year. Um, and so there is absolutely no obligation for libraries to join this, but it is an opportunity for you all to show your support for open access in a tangible way. Um, and so we've had pretty good support from libraries so far. And the idea is that we use some of that money to directly support the books that we publish. And whatever's left over from that goes into a waiver fund for Luminous. Um, there are, of course, plenty of institutions, particularly smaller liberal arts colleges and so on, that simply are not going to be able to cover these ex costs at this point in the way that, say, a large research institution is going to be able to. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about you know, what we've seen uh, so far in, in implementing Luminous. We started publishing books in, in September. Uh, we've published 11 titles at this point. Um, some of them published as recently as last week, so, you know, the numbers are pretty new here. Um, the good news is that we're sort of beating every single goal that we'd set for the program. Um, the first was in print sales. Um, we assumed that with a, few, a free digital version available that our print sales of each book would be maybe 75 to 100 copies. So far in just six months, we're averaging around 200 copies, which is pretty close to what we sold when there wasn't a free digital version available. Um, and there are some books that have sold as many as 800 to 1,000 copies in, in print. So I think there's clear, clearly a demand for a reasonably priced print version still. Um, our goal was to generate $60,000 in library support in the first year. We've already generated uh, $67,500 in support. Um, I know a number of you here in this room have supported it. The UC libraries have all supported it. UT Austin was one of our earliest and most generous supporters. Um, so that's, that's been great for us to see. And then I think, you know, in really um, talking about the goals that we had for Luminous, um, this last number here, our number of downloads, is, is great to see. Again, it's pretty early days. 
Um, but this is certainly more than we would have seen for monographs pub published in the traditional way. And again, if you start to look at that by country and by region, um, it becomes all the more stark. So not surprisingly, the US and the UK still have the highest usage. Um, but there are countries in the top 10 here who would not appear on a list of sales um, at all. So you look at countries like Mexico and Brazil and India. Um, so I think this is early data that helps to support the argument that there is a mon market for monographic scholarship that is well beyond um, the libraries that, and institutions that can currently afford to pay for it. So I then wanted to talk a little bit about what we've been doing to try and help support um, Luminous and, and Calabra and what it's involved. I think we realized pretty early on that we were going to have to do far more than simply promote the books that we published in the usual way we promote our books. We continue to do that. But there's a much bigger role for us as kind of you know one of the, f the first university press, I think, to launch a major program in open access. Um, and that was to really sort of play a role in both advocacy and education. So, you know, we're very active on social media. Um, we spent a lot of time at different conferences. Um, this include publishing conferences, um, but a lot of library conferences. Um, you know, I was at Charleston last year. I was at ALA last year. I'm speaking here. But we're also trying to reach out to the academic conferences. So, you know, as an example, I organized a panel at the Modern Language Association back in January to talk about open access monographs and the switch to digital. And I think that's really a good example of what we feel we need to do in terms of engaging faculty and scholars in the conversation. Too often, the discussion discussions about the benefits of open access and how we make that move are in rooms like this with librarians and publishers. And I think we're really missing you know, a critical group of stakeholders if we're going to move this forward. Um, the next is in campus outreach. So we spend, you know, I was um, doing a symposium um, at UCLA on Friday for graduate students, a kind of get them young principle, um, introducing them to open access and to what we're doing with Luminous. Our editors, when they're out on campus, um, are doing presentations on this. So it's a kind of pretty intensive process. And as you as librarians will all know, um, you know, it does take a lot of work to try and engage faculty and students around some of these issues, but we do think that's an important part um, of what we're trying to achieve. I think one of the um, byproducts for UC Press um, that has been great to see has been uh, the fact that I think in some ways we've sort of become a go-to voice for open access in the university press community. That wasn't an initial goal, um, but I think it's been great to see that. And you know, we very much hope that our leadership in this area is going to make it possible for other presses to, to follow us um, pretty quickly. That said, and excited as I am about Luminous and everything that we've managed to do so far, I think there are still some pretty serious questions about how we move forward. Um, you know, in terms of the monograph itself, there are a host of unanswered questions about the nature of the monograph and whether it's for authors or for readers, and if it's for readers, what kind of readers. And then there are a lot of questions in these fields about emerging forms of digital scholarship that don't neatly fit within a monograph form, whether it's print or digital. Um, you know, leaving those to the side for the moment, um, I want to focus um, specifically on what I think some of the challenges are for open access monographs. I think this one still, you know, as you've probably picked up through my presentation, I think this remains sort of top and uh, top of the list. The fundamental challenge in many ways is cultural. Um, I was on a panel with Mike Eisen during Open Access Week at Berkeley last fall, and it was interesting to see that his attention at this point has shifted from promoting OA to advocating changes in the way in which faculty are assessed as being a critical precursor to, to really um, seeing open access fl flourish. And I think the same is true for monographs, the entrenched value system whereby authors prefer prestigious publication venues because their voting colleagues on promotion and tenure committees prefer prestigious publication venues. Um, means that, you know, human nature means that they are always going to choose those venues whenever they are able to, and it's going to take a while to change that dynamic. Next, I think, are some real issues um, around, uh, let's start with licensing rights and discoverability. One of the key issues is around what the light, right licensing model is for books. And you know, we heard this morning about the way in which CC BY is required by the Gates Foundation, and it is indeed the standard that's been applied to journals. We looked into that quite carefully with books, and it was pretty clear to us from faculty that we would not sign any open access monographs if we required CC BY at this point. 
Um, so open access purists may not like that reality, but our approach was that we really wanted to get started with publishing open access monographs and to show that it could be done sustainably and successfully and with the quality we expect from any other UC press book. So the, the approach we took was to um, indicate a preference to our authors for CC BY and explain why that was important, but we gave them the choice of CC licenses. So it is interesting to see with the 11 books that we've published, six have opted for the most restrictive license, three have opted, sorry, three have opted for licenses somewhere in the middle, and two have actually opted for CC BY. I think that's something that we'll see evolve over time as faculty in these fields start to understand a little bit more about both open access and the different licensing options. The second issue that we run into around rights is really the one with third party rights. It doesn't affect every field we publish in, but it does make a field like art history incredibly challenging. Um, we are, uh, we're just assigned a new series of art history books um, for Luminous, but they are in medieval and Renaissance art because getting anywhere near contemporary art at this point is almost impossible. Um, and then discoverability. I think this is a critical issue for libraries and uh, the way in which open access content is or isn't discoverable in your library. This wasn't really something we've thought about before we got into, into Luminous, but we found a couple of key issues here. The first is the way in which you usually get your mark records and other cataloging data is through vendors like YBP who have no interest in carrying open access content because there's nothing to earn from it. So you know, we've been in, com in conversation with people like YBP, but that's a critical one that needs to be addressed. And I think the more that libraries can do to tell their vendors that they want to receive all records, including open access content, will help drive that as well. And the second that I've heard occasionally from libraries, and I hope from no one in this room, is that you don't need to um, catalog open access material because you don't own it. And there's this sense that your library is what you own in your little building, and if it's not there, you don't need to catalog it. Again, I think it's really important if you want that open access content to be used and discovered um, to, to think a little differently about that. This next one about technology enhancements for long form reading online. Um, you know, I think what I just say briefly there is that the digital book has to get much closer to the experience of reading print for it to become an acceptable alternative. And there are a lot of things tied up in that, and I'm sure it will happen eventually, um, but I think that's really important for long form content. And then this last one is kind of the critical one, which is um, the business models. Um, the way in which we've developed Luminous is sort of scaffolding off the resources that are available there at the moment. I don't think that's going to be the long-term solution. Um, we absolutely expect that the funding model for Luminous will evolve um, as more opportunities come online. But I think a far more significant change in commitment is going to be required at an institutional level um, if we're really going to get beyond the sort of um, handful of options that we that we have right now. You know, that said, we hope that Luminous um, is making a, a sort of a, a real contribution towards developing a sustainable model. And I think really importantly to demonstrating that an open access monograph is not only no different, but is actually better than a traditional monograph. So thank you. To introduce. It's not at the beginning. We'll go to the beginning here. Second is, is Susie Allen, who's the Associate Dean of Research for College and Communications, University of Tennessee. She has been involved in a, a, a list that is um, uh, enormous of various different. Uh, uh, um, boards and processes and things in, involving uh, technology and uh, I'm really looking forward to, she's going to be talking about sus sustainable and innovative business models to support institutional no, that's, data. So. No, no, that's, the, that's not me, but I'll tell you what I'm talking about. Not oh. for sust not, not sustainable models. But, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I no, it's okay. But anyway, it no, 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 that right. makes well, it more I, exciting. I sorry, um, anyway. I come from an entertainment background, so this is great, because now I have a teaser that will really got your attention. <laughs> These words up here, I, I, first off, I want to thank you all for inviting me to be here, and I've been really delighted to get to meet everybody, and, well, not everybody, but many of you, and there's one thing that I have really enjoyed, which is, no matter what your role in this process of open access, whoops, I'm hitting, aren't I? No matter what your role is in, in the process of open access, you're all so passionate 
And being around that passion is invigorating, and I really, really appreciate that. These words, I went online and I pulled down a whole lot of vision statements from a bunch of different universities. These are words that appear, and knowledge appears a lot. And I didn't do a word cloud because I just wanted you to think about those words for a minute and what it means in terms of, of open access because knowledge plays a really central role. And when we think about what's happening in society right now and the kinds of questions we have to ask and deal with as society as a whole, and because I come from the environmental science world of information, I of course picked things around environmental sciences, things like uh, global climate change, um, GMOs, genetically modified organisms, things like that, sustainable energy, renewable energy. These are questions that are really big uh, and they require uh, these challenges require a lot more disciplines to be working together. And in doing that, you know, they come from a range of different methodologies, a range of different um, paradigms, but they all do one thing together, and they all create data. And that's how we're going to be able to, to tackle some of these problems, is to be able to put the data together. And as one famous man, albeit he's fictional, said, data, 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 I can't make any bricks without clay way back with Sherlock Holmes. But it's true today. You know, we can't really be thinking about what we're going to do until we have the data. And you know, the importance of data as a federal resource, we heard Jerry Sheehan this morning speaking about that. Um, one of the things that happened in 2015 was the appointment of the US's first chief data scientist, which is a brand new title and a brand new way to think about it. Um, we have had CEOs on, uh, prominent news programs saying, you know, it's a world's natural resource for the, this century and the next. So this is a really important issue. And that kind of brings me to thinking about, well, this morning we talked about a rising tide of faculty research. And in that vein, I got to thinking about the tide and the horizon. So we're on a, we're on a case where we're in a data horizon. What is the data horizon? And I'm going to share some thoughts about how universities um, and libraries should think about data as an opportunity to create services and build programs. Um, that will benefit the research community both at their university and in society as general. My comments are, are evidence-based. I am fortunate to work with a range of colleagues on a range of programs of which we have done research, and I'm going to report some of those results. 20 minutes isn't very long, so you're getting like the really, really, really Cliff Notes version, and in this case, Cliff Notes is good. Um, and I, you know, we have had a lot of opportunities. Two of the projects I'm going to speak about are things that I'm a co-PI on. One project you've been hearing about today, Pay It Forward, I am not a co-PI, I'm not associated with it except that my colleague Carol Tenniper is involved in that and she shared some uh, uh, information that she had presented at another conference and I wanted to include it as well. Just to make sure we're all on the same page, we all know this def these definitions of data because it's part of what Spark talks about, but I just wanted you to know that this is also what I'm talking to in terms of freely available, uh, used the, the, the R's, you know, without financial or legal, technical barriers, all of those things, okay? So I just want you to know that I'm on the same page with you when I'm speaking about this. Also, Spark has a really good list of why open data. And I included this because the slide set will be available and if somebody's going through the slide set and is not familiar with Spark, I wanted them to also be aware of these really important reasons. And you know, I know these are very familiar, but I do want to just call your attention to the fact that we heard this morning about growing the economy uh, in the EU, uh, talking about the accelerated pace of discovery, which can only be good for society, uh, we hope. Um, and improving the integrity of scientific and scholarly record is really, really an important one as well. They're all important. So the first project I'm going to speak to you about is called Data One. Uh, I'm a co-PI on this project. It is um, a large cyber infrastructure project that Data One stands for Observation Network uh, Earth. And uh, we're building a distributed framework and sustainable cyber infrastructure to serve as a foundation for innovative um, environmental science. And what I mean by that is thinking about modeling things in new ways, doing things in different ways to look at the whole environment and the problems that we're facing. Uh, we are all about supporting access, preservation, use, and most importantly, reuse of multi-scale, multidiscipline, and multinational science data. Our member nodes are all over the world. We have them in South Africa. We have them in South America. We have them um, in the United States, of course. And um, in 2009, we were funded as one of the uh, data nets, uh, part of the National Science Foundation, and 
We did five years that way. We were renewed for phase two, and we're about 18 months into phase two at this point. So we're kind of a, um, an ongoing laboratory about openness and open science and open data. What we do in data one is we look at things in two ways. Cyber infrastructure we see as being technology, people, and processes. And there's a much longer explanation for that, but that's the quickest way to think about it. I work on a team that really focuses on people. And we were given the very, very modest charge of change the culture of science. That came right from NSF. Um, so that was like, oh, well, how are we going to do that? That's a big role. And because open data has not been a part of the culture of science for a terribly long time. Being replication was, has been a part of it, but sharing your actual result, your actual data, sharing your results was, but not always sharing your data in a very open way. So one of the things we had to do first was think about our stakeholders. And you'll notice at the top I have an acronym, UAWG. That's for the Usability and Assessment Working Group. We broke down into a, a large number of our working groups led by different people. And the Usability and Assessment Working Group is based at the University of Tennessee, and it's led by Carol Tenniper from Tennessee and from, by Mike Frame from USGS. And as a co-PI, I also sit on this group. And um, we had to first think about who our stakeholders were. And I think this is a really, really important component of open data, is thinking about who your stakeholders are. And in our world, for this project, scientists are the center of the universe. And they operate in a range of different domains. And you'll see them listed there in terms of being in government or in academe. And you'll notice that in all places, there's libraries and librarians. Because we had to think at both an institutional and an individual level. Because an institution can support it, but if the librarians aren't adequately funded or trained, it's difficult to carry out that mandate. And scientists have to know that these people are there to help them. And they have to know they're being institutionally supported or not. So this is how we started thinking about it. Because of that, understanding and wanting to see, number one, what our communities knew, and number two, if we were moving the needle, um, we did a range of assessments. And we did assessments with a number of different community members. We did it with scientists, of course, and I'll, and I'll report on results of a couple of these, scientific educators who would be working with data area, um, with libraries as an institution, with librarians as individuals, those who are pro providing the services, um, and also with US government scientists, which is a little different. Today I'm going to be talking about three of the assessments and then uh, move into a different project as well. So our scientist assessments, uh, we've done two. We're about to field our third one um, in the beginning of the next academic year. Um, and what we're doing here is we're asking the same questions mostly. In some cases, we've had to change the questions a little bit because we've learned from our community as we've gone, and so that has changed the survey instrument to a, to a small degree. Um, and thanks to PLOS, we've gotten published and a huge amount of visibility, which is fantastic, um, because we hear from people in a range of different areas. We've talked to groups um, dealing with medical information, um, with information, uh, scientific information of different kinds. Um, if you want to go look at these articles, they're available, and the data sets that support all this work is also available for your use and pleasure and reuse. One of the things we really wanted to think about with scientists is what are they doing? What are their practices? And in that way, I pulled out key measures. Now we have a lot more measures than this, but these are some of the ones that show some of the most interesting motion. First off, you'll notice that the uh, Green is 2014, and the blue is 2010. That's when the, f the survey was fielded. And these are all statistically significant differences that you're looking at. Um, you'll notice that they say that they have more time than they used to. And at first we thought, gosh, why are they telling us they have more time instead of less time? Or why has that changed? And we did some follow-up um, interviews and found that a lot of this has to do with the fact that now they know they have to do it, so it's kind of part of their planning process. So it doesn't seem so uh, foreign as it did just a little bit of before that. In terms of needing to publish first, that was not a question that we asked in 2010. But you'll notice that that is still a very, very important component of thinking about whether they're going to share or how they feel about sharing their data. Lack of funding uh, was something of a surprise because you'll notice that lack of funding is not so much of a problem of being a barrier to publishing data as it used to be. And that is, um, digging a little deeper on that, 
That is that some of the offices of research, especially the uh, research intensive universities, have been able to do a little bit of funding and help people out. And library, uh, libraries are also stepping up to the plate in many cases and helping to where the funding isn't as uh, much of an issue because they have institutional support that didn't exist before. Don't have rights to make the data public. We saw this rise and we were trying to understand where that came from. And we believe that that is um, a case that scientists are beginning to understand the issues of rights um, and are now trying to figure out whether they can or they can't. And in, you know, the, our, scientific, um, our scientist survey includes social scientists as well. And so when you're dealing with human subjects, there are some unique issues. Um, that pervade. So for example, our data that is available to you about these surveys, uh, everything's been anonymized so that there's no personal identifiers and we've had to clean it in order to make it available. But you know, you had to think about those rights, um, to, the right to be able to do so. Um, there's no, no, I mean, yeah, there's no place to put them. Well, we see that that's moved a little bit. We heard the, all the talk this morning about repositories. That's a good thing, um, but that's still a problem that's raising. And the last one is a, real, um, a really interesting one. People don't need them. This is a huge opportunity. So now we have more people than ever saying, nobody wants my scientific data. People don't need them. And this is an education issue because in our world where there's a lot of modeling going on, they aren't really thinking about the fact how these data can be integrated um, into a larger model and create some kind of new knowledge or new understanding. And that is another place that I think we, as librarians, are uniquely situated to be able to talk across the domain specific silos that exist. I'm going to move to the educator survey. As I told you, just quick top lines on each one. Uh, the educator survey, um, we've published in a couple different places. And key measures here have to do with uh, no time to teach data management, not my area of expertise, and I don't have enough information. Keep those in mind, because when we talk about potential of future, this is another area that we are uniquely positioned to help. These are talking to, these are scientists who are ed creating the next generation of scientists, but don't know how to help them know how to deal with the data. And finally, a quick pre, uh, overview, not an overview, a quick peek at our library assessments. And here I just put up um, 2014, and that's because in 2010, most of our respondents were very, very uh, from research intensive libraries, uh, uh, libraries at research intensive universities. This time we got a much larger sample of libraries uh, as far as, a, it was a smaller sample as far as the actual in, but a larger diversity of locations. So the numbers are kind of hard to compare because the uh, sample is quite different in that way, demographically. But you'll notice that we have quite a few who are offering services, um, but there is a lot of potential here to offer more. We also looked at that this doesn't add up to 100% of our sample, which meant a lot of people weren't answering each of these questions. So we did um, a follow-up. One of our um, associates called a range of the people that we know it went out to. We didn't know who answered, but we had an idea who it went out to, and asked them to get a little greater understanding of this. And basically, we believe that the people who were no, and even though it says greater than 24 months, if it was greater than 24 months, they felt that they really couldn't answer a lot of folks because it wasn't yet on their horizon. It wasn't yet something they were planning for. So I think this is another place that shows us great opportunity. I'm going to talk for just a moment about pay it forward, um, which, as I said, you've been hearing about here. And I know that the list of people is much, much greater who are colleagues on this project. But I wanted to list a couple that you know from, like Greg here uh, with, with Spark, and Carol, who is uh, heading up the focus group and survey team. And from this group, I wanted to talk to scholars in training. I wanted to hear what they were talking. I didn't talk to them, but I wanted to hear what they were thinking about open access in general. And this wasn't just about data, but it's kind of their reactions to open access in general, which is important. Um, and they believe open access saves time searching and tracking down articles and they think it's better to share. Um, and what was really interesting to me was the finding that they really thought the timely uh, sharing can be essential in certain areas. So we're back to looking at societal problems and trying to make differences quickly. Um, and they liked the, the idea of the democracy and the universal access to information, which is all what we understand and know. But their concerns 
um, as scholars in training has, had to do again with costs and with the idea that um, they might be forced to um, leave academe if they had to go up open access because it wasn't part of the review process. So it's just something to, to kind of keep in mind, this concept of we're still dealing with a stigma with, you may have made a huge, huge amount of difference, but our youngers, so to speak, the ones who are following us are still um, in a situation where it's hard to get the message because they're, they're um, being influenced by folks who may not yet really understand or believe in open access. Um, the la last project I'd like to talk about br briefly is called the Open Data Imperative, and it is um, one that is funded by IMLS and kind of led by CLEAR. Alice Bishop has been helping us uh, put this all together, and you'll see my colleagues up there. And what we did is we wanted to be thinking about what it means for the cultural heritage community, the move to open data, and what can we learn from the scientific community? Um, and what lessons can there be to improve delivery of open data uh, in a cultural heritage arena. And so we used three different approaches to study this. We did a content analysis of the federal agency plans and a little more than a content analysis, but to kind of give us an overview of what's going on there. We did case studies of some IMLS funded projects that were dealing with data curation. And we also looked at an um, education and readiness assessment for the workforce because we cannot move ahead without having a sufficient workforce to do this. And from that, we developed a framework um, to be thinking about these things. And we think there's, from looking at all this uh, data, we came up with three areas where our recommendations all lie, which is the open data infrastructure that we really need to have, be ready for and um, have persistent access to usable and coherent data. And how do we do that? And we have recommendations for that. Uh, the roles and responsibilities, who's gonna be doing this? Um, because it's really important to think about improving the culture surrounding data production use and preservation. And you'll notice I mentioned culture a lot. And we talked, the third area we thought about was called taking the data public, which is about collaborations, like Jerry was talking about this morning. You know, how can we learn from each other and support each other, especially the cultural heritage community, which may not be connected and at the table of all these. And the full report is forthcoming um, in 2016, but we have a paper at IDCC with some preliminary results. So just very quickly, what have we seen in trends? Interest in sharing data among scientists is increasing. Um, it's not a lot, but it is statistically significant. And you'll see that being, they would use it if it was easy to get to and easily accessible, yay, open data. Um, that they were um, share across a broad group of researchers, which is good because we're talking about interdisciplinary work and that it's appropriate to create new data sets from shared data sets, and that is a very, very important part of integration into new data sets for new ways of understanding uh, societal problems. We also learned that there's an increasing use of metadata standards, while still way too many nuns on that list, um, we, there, and way too many in the lab. You'll notice that both of those are decreasing, and people are moving towards standards for metadata, which is a good thing. And finally, we also are seeing that the conditions that scientists place, that they themselves place on the idea of sharing data is, are decreasing. The conditions are not as great as they used to be. And you know, this is a really amazing thing, especially if you look at the very bottom one, that they want a complete list of all the products that came from their data. Well, you know, that would be really difficult for a lot of people to comply with, and that is a lot less important than it used to be. And this is good. This means the culture is changing. And I'm not saying data one is changing it because we know we're just a small piece of the entire environment that's happening out there, but it is great to see this, and we're looking forward to the results from our second follow-up. What this all means is that we are charting a new course, and we're trying to figure out where that horizon is. Some of us are already at the horizon and going over. Some of us are still figuring out that it's up there and figuring out how to get where we're going. So when we think about the horizon, we know that there's an aware, uh, awareness is growing, but researchers are still lack understanding and the skill sets that they need. We know that they still don't have time or materials to teach data management best practices and the um, open education work that we heard this morning is important in this area. And we also know that many libraries aren't yet offering research data services. Um, and for some, it may not even be on the horizon yet. So to reach the horizon, what do we need to do? Um, we know that the researcher critical mass is building. More researchers are aware of 
the open data issue and how to address it. We know that we have libraries already at the horizon, so they can be the lead ship or leadership. Get it? Um, sorry. Uh, we know that institutional commitment is being modeled by the federal uh, agency mandate, and that this may be something, you know, as we heard, it's hard to move the federal government, and that it moved that way, it's something that the other institutions that may be lagging can be thinking about. Um, we know that the data management plan and metadata support can be very, very high value commitments, so that if you, in terms of helping your, um, your community of users, that those are areas that you might want to think about offering services. And we know that the library legacy um, of what we've always offered, of what we've always been, and who we've always been in protecting the cultural canon um, is strong, and that it can really help in this area as well. And that might be you know, how your library can approach offering RDS services is thinking first about what you've always done and done well, and then how to transport it into this new arena. And with that, I'll close and say, you know, how will we sail past that horizon? Thank you. Third, we've got Danny Anderson, who's the president of Trinity University here in San Antonio. Um, I'm not even going to try and read out what I think he's going to talk about, but um, uh, I've got something here, but I think he's going to talk about his experiences of being the president of the university and the experiences there. So thank you very much. OK, that's great. My slideshow, finally. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Uh, this is not the typical group that I am with to speak. Um, I'm new in San Antonio, but it's a real pleasure. I get to welcome you to my new hometown. Uh, my new home university. So thank you all for being in San Antonio. If you have a few minutes and can get away, Trinity University is about a 10 minute taxi ride from here. Um, if you're interested in architecture, it's considered to be the masterpiece of mid 20th century architecture by O'Neill Ford. It's sort of an icon in the city of San Antonio. When you go back to the airport, look on the west side of the highway, a tall red brick tower, that's at the very heart of our campus. So um, I am really glad to be here in San Antonio. I started my position June 1, so I don't even have a full year um, in this role. And I'm going to do one of the things that when you start a new job, you should never do. Um, I always think about all those times when people are in a new job and they talk about, oh, back at, and they name the place they came from. They say, we used to do this, we used to do that. And you get really sick of hearing that very, very fast. Uh, but there is an interesting bridge between these two places. Uh, so before I joined Trinity University, I want to give you a good picture of the, the campus there. I worked for 27 years at the University of Kansas. Um, and a lot of the story that I think um, people that you would know connects between these two universities. Um, you know, some of the people that I worked with at the University of Kansas watching open access emerge there um, included Lorraine Harricombe, who is here, Ada Emmett. Um, I had um, Mark Greenberg, I believe, has spoken with different ones of you at different events. Um, also, Dave Schulenberger was a provost for many years at the University of Kansas. So it's this really interesting connection that I bring as I move into my new position. Um, and the brief way to tell the story is that while I was at KU, I played a co close observer role, but I was never directly on the front line of trying to make everything happen. And I'm going to tell this story. It's pretty complicated, but I think I've got a way to make it go pretty fast. Uh, I changed jobs every year, three years in a row. So one year, I was the vice provost for academic affairs, and that is when in faculty senate, the first version of the open access policy was up for debate. Um, I was sitting there in that meeting, and often faculty senate meetings, uh, one of the descriptions I've heard is that they are three hours of tedium and sometimes three minutes of terror, because <laughs> we were looking at the whole vote go up for defeat. Um, someone made a very gentle modification. It bought life into the proposal. The faculty were willing to go along with that. So then the following year, second job for me, I was the interim provost. Um, I was in the role when we approved uh, the open access policy. Um, and then the final third year of this for me is that as the interim provost, the last action that I had was appointing Lorraine Harricombe as the leader, as our librarian at KU, uh, of the implementation task force. Um, and the next year, I became the dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and Lorraine appointed me to be one of the members of the first open access board. Uh, so I, 
I, I bring those kinds of experiences and watching the challenges, and I served on that board for five years as dean until I, I just moved to Trinity. Uh, so moving to Trinity, it was great. Um, I am here looking, learning more. Um, I'm from Texas originally. I was extremely interested in Trinity, and I start learning Diane Graves is the librarian. Trinity had its open access policy in fall 2009, the first Oberlin Group University to have an open access policy the semester before KU uh, had its open access policy as a public research university. Um, so as a newcomer, I felt this great alignment uh, with some of the things going on there. And then also as a new president, you like to learn about your alumni. Nick Shockey, uh, one of the members here at Spark, uh, one of your directors, yes, um, is a Trinity alumnus. Presidents love to brag on their alumni. Uh, so I, I'm really proud uh, to be at Trinity and to see the kind of role uh, that we are playing in terms of accomplishing many things. Um, I was just uh, inaugurated as president, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of my experiences. Uh, this picture for me sort of combines my world. Um, it is the very end of my investiture celebration. I'm walking right into the heart of campus, and I also have a KU PhD. They hired me back from University of Texas. So those are sort of the KU colors combined with Trinity Campus that you know weaves together my experience here. Um, beyond, I'm, I'm basically going to tell you a personal story and try and draw out some lessons that I think that as you think about a new president or a new leader whom you may be trying to work with, what can you do to help them get on board and deepen their commitment to open access? So I'd say one of the things is to think about is that you want your leader to be an advocate for open access, for openness. Um, I was a faculty member in Spanish and Portuguese at KU. David Schulenberger was the provost, um, and it was in the years when he was developing his insights as an economist, analyzing how the scholarly publishing industry worked. Um, I was also a department chair during those years. Um, I was looking at faculty members whom I was trying to help think about how are you going to have a successful publishing career. So the kind of things that Dave was talking about externally, he was also talking about internally as we were thinking about how do we help our colleagues have successful scholarly careers. Um, just to summarize briefly, if you do not know Dave's work, I would say that the key thing is that he pointed out that the economic system of scholarly publishing is an anomaly in terms of supply, demand, and the lack of competition. In the system of scholarly publishing, universities provide the labor, the facilities, and the overhead for scholarly research, writing, peer review, and editing. And then university authors give away that work by relinquishing all of their copyrights. And to close the loop, libraries then buy back the same work of the university authors via expensive subscriptions to scholarly journals and other publication formats. Um, Dave, his analysis really looks at what was behind that paywall. Uh, there was a lost opportunity, according to him. And he argued that in the academy, we hide our work, if we hide our work in an inaccessible subscription-based publication, and that it may be intended only for a very narrow audience, uh, we are risk losing relevance for our society as a whole. Uh, if we feel like the only reason that we do research, editing, peer review, and publishing is to gain tenure, promotion, grant funding, and status among our disciplinary peers, we risk becoming the arrogant ivory tower eggheads that those outside the academy sometimes claim that we are. When we allow only certain populations of students and faculty, those at the wealthiest colleges, in the wealthiest states, in the wealthiest countries, to have exclusive access to content, we risk becoming the insensitive, ugly Americans of privilege that we ourselves often deride. Um, when I talk with Dave, I know that he believes in the good of a, the public good of American higher education. He proposes in all of his research that sharing the output of our best researchers breaks down those barriers and it keep, that keeps others from learning, knowing, and understanding. Success at overcoming these obstacles demonstrates the value of higher education to our society as a whole. And, and I really have enjoyed the panel listening to the ways that University of California Press, listening to University of Tennessee are looking at how do we all think about reshaping this model around the concept of openness. Um, I am very grateful to have learned some of these lessons from Dave Schulenberger and from Lorraine Herricombe and Ada Emmett and many others at KU. 
as I mentioned earlier, I was an easy convert because I was a department chair. One of the things that I really like about Dave Schulenberger's philosophy is that he points out that we are the ones who wrote these rules that we feel like constrain us so much. Um, and that is a very important insight because all of the work that you're doing also is advocating that we can rewrite those rules and we can change that system, which I think is really crucial. That, that is a very powerful philosophical insight. So now I'm at Trinity and I'm looking at all of my many duties um, and I think about Dave Schulenberger, the kind of role model that he could play in terms of looking at what does a leader do to advocate for the kind of changes uh, in communication systems and open access. Um, for years, the advocates have been primarily people like the majority of you, librarians. Um, but I think that working with administrators and faculty supporters, you have created a real opportunity of grassroots supporters. And I hope that some of my comments will help you think about the way that you can convince others to be your allies on your individual campuses. I believe that there is an opportunity for new partners in the open access movement. Presidents and provosts may need to take up the cause. And what better time than now? Politicians and parents alike are calling for higher education to be more affordable, accessible, and accountable. Federal agencies routinely require that the research funded by their, pro by their programs be available to the taxpayers who are funding it. Private organizations such as the Gates Foundation and the Hewlett Foundation require that publications resulting from their support be made available freely. As I think about this situation, I am grateful for Dave's example in showing how a university leader can advocate for meaningful change and effective stewardship of scarce resources through the support of openness. The second idea is that leaders act as role models for the faculty. Open access policies rely on faculty members making their scholarship available through repositories. University leaders can act as role models in this regard. Rather than playing the role of a policy enforcer, making sure that everyone else's material is available, we have to be the ones who take the lead and make sure that our scholarship is there first. Um, I have done that. I checked Diane, we gotta be sure that mine is up and available. I know that we've got it all there. Um, identifying your core group, uh, identifying your core group of change agents and early adopters is also important for gaining momentum. Uh, sometimes we think about what does it take to get everyone going. Um, it's really more important in my experience to think about getting some of the right people going. Identifying that department that wants to be the first one recognized because every department member had his or her work in the repository can be a great first step. Uh, these are the kinds of actions that signal clearly to the campus that open access is important. These actions can create a context in which we can allay fears and show that open access does not create a risk for tenure and promotion. Faculty members need to hear this message from those who make tenure and promotion decisions and from leaders who have their own works accessible in the institutional repository. More than anything, and quite understandably so, our faculty colleagues fear the loss of their jobs, their status, their reputations. Open access policies may appear threatening or dangerous from a career building perspective. By acting as a role model and using these actions to convey persuasive messages, we demonstrate by example, as role models, that there are many ways to be open and not harm one's career. In fact, openness can be beneficial when it makes your scholarship more accessible, more discussed, and more widely cited. The third idea here is that leaders need to spend time acknowledging and praising successes. Uh, here I am nine months in to a new position at Trinity University, and I have observed how our faculty have truly embraced the open access policy. Uh, many of them regularly submit their content to our institutional repository, which has been doubling in size annually. Working with the library, many of them maintain custom pages on our selected works site, which provides link to the, links to their repository contributions. And those who do so report citation rates that are much higher than their colleagues. They can track their downloads and they have a very strong sense that their work really has an impact in the world. I've not done this yet, 
But one of the things that I realize as a new president is to find venues. I have a monthly column that I write about and looking for occasions when I can talk back to my campus about the kind of success that I see with our faculty members who are using the in institutional repository to its fullest extent. One of the four things that I think I have to do that other leaders need to do is to talk about the things that faculty are afraid of, address their fears. Uh, there are still many faculty members at Trinity who do not participate in the institutional repository. Um, I've already commented about the fear about tenure and promotion, uh, but I think others are afraid that the claims that all open access journals are really fronts for predatory publishers. Uh, they, this, they, cynic, they see the cynically named open offers from traditional subscription publishers, often associated with a very hefty subscription, and question why openness places the financial burden on a professor. Um, others fear that publishing anywhere but a top tier journal will result in their academic death, or worse, the denial of tenure promotion. Librarians cannot reassure faculty away from these perceptions. University leaders may not be able to completely solve the problem either, but we can begin to address the fears. As presidents, provosts, vice presidents for academic affairs, members of p and committees, we can support experimentation with new models without punishing the pioneers. A provost or a vice president for academic affairs, for example, can guide discussions that allow faculty to express their worries. I love seeing the, the focus groups that you had with faculty members talking about exactly what it was that concerned them. By listening and understanding the source of these concerns, safeguards and reassurances can be established. University leaders can refer to materials found in the institutional repository in their speeches and communications to the campus, to trustees, to alumni. We can mention repository held materials in conversations with peer administrators at other institutions. Uh, we may take something that doesn't seem particularly exciting and call attention to it as a point of distinction and pride. Um, so my fifth point, and I'm gonna try and combine a couple of things here, we need to analyze data. I love the way that you had done these surveys to look at some of the trends, what is going on. Um, and I'm gonna try and practice what I preach, give you an example from our institutional repository and some data to brag about one of the projects that is really wonderful at Trinity University. Uh, we call our repository the Digital Commons, um, and within it, we showcase our star Master of Arts in Teaching program. Um, each summer, the Education Department hosts a Summer Curriculum Writing Institute, which brings back to campus experienced teachers who are alumni of the program. The Institute culminates with newly created curricular and teaching units, open educational resources. And here is the data. This is a, a, a spring just to see it. When you look at it, there's this wonderful map. Um, it is moving all the time. Uh, the dots will be animated to highlight different um, pieces that are available. You can see who is reading it, where it's being read. Uh, but this is a slide with some of the information, and I missed one point there. There are over 331 entries uh, in a site called Understanding by Design, and this is the, the group that works on these open educational resources. Um, as of early January 2016, there have been 813,000 downloads of those curricular units. Um, and you can see here the top 10 countries. Um, you can see the five most important agencies uh, that have worked on this. Um, Trinity University is a small university. We have 2,400 students, about 250 faculty members. When I look at this kind of information, the impact, the reach, really impresses me because of what you can do through openness. The next point, the last one that I wanna make, is that leaders need to articulate messages that can be used to influence others. As university leaders, we have access to a bully pulpit. We have to be careful not to overuse it, but we do have an opportunity to advocate for transitions to new models to make them less risky, less scary. Today, change is constant in higher education, and it is likely to remain so for years. Why not create an environment in which some changes are less threatening? Success stories and data can be used to articulate powerful stories about reach and impact. But another topic that needs a better articulation of messages is the field of new publishing models. 
Trinity University, for example, supports the new Lever Press initiative, and I'm told that Trinity was among the very first to pledge its financial support. We have also participated in ventures such as Peer J and other initiatives that promote and experiment with new publication models. And just a couple of days ago, I received an email from one of our soci sociology professors, Dr. David Spiner, who is letting me know that his new book, We Shall Not Be Moved, No Nos Moverán, Biography of a Song of Struggle, has just been unlatched through the Temple University Press Collection with Knowledge Unlatched. Trinity University has supported these initiatives because it is part of our values. These publishing models belong to the open access initiative discussed and approved by our faculty almost six years ago. I believe that Trinity University benefits when our name appears on the list of leader institutions in such programs. And of course, all five of the earlier ideas that I've suggested can be used to articulate messages that can be used to persuade the, the campus community regarding the goal of openness. So the last idea that I want to lead you with is you are here and I hope that you can think about what is the counterpart of these ideas? How are you going to lead your leaders when you return to your campuses? I've talked about some of my experiences and I was trying to think about how could I recast those. Um, you might be thinking about when you're looking at a new leader on your campus, what are the challenges that he or she may be facing? Um, and the way that you may be able to think about helping them is picking out places where they could immediately become an advocate or something they can do to act in a way that would help them serve as a role model for openness. Um, a second way that you might think about what you could do is you know, what can you ask that person uh, to do that would help faculty feel more supportive of openness and perhaps less threatened by the new models. Um, so you might want to look around your campus to identify some stories. What are some of the successes uh, that they could do and what are some specific examples that might help address fears on your campus? Um, and then finally, you need to help us all have conversations about ways that we can look at faculty reward systems to try and tip the balance in favor of openness. Um, do you have access to data in regard to some of your faculty members who use open access publishing and how that may be a part of their success on the path to promotion and tenure? Um, can you help them use some of that data to craft a compelling message to the campus community? Um, and then finally, one of the things that I would suggest is to think about how can you identify ways that your institution's reputation can be strengthened by support for open access. And for this last question, I am still learning about Trinity's annual review process. Uh, I think this is a proposal that probably would be threatening. Um, I really am just curious, for the faculty who do not deposit their works in the institutional repository, what is it that's going on? You know, is there some mechanism where we could survey on an annual basis or periodically to know what is happening? Is it that they have forgotten and they just aren't aware of the policy? Or is it that our own addendum that they send in to the journal perhaps turns people off? Um, or is it that they were asked for an additional $3,500 and they decided not to run with it? You know, just how are we going to learn what are some of the obstacles because um, one of the things that my colleagues up here have been talking about is understanding the obstacles so that they can be removed. Um, I am still pondering my next steps at Trinity. Um, with regard to open educational resources in my very first talk to the faculty assembly, um, I did include reference to the idea of one of the logical next steps for us would be looking at uh, some of the open textbooks as we are facing issues like everyone else thinking about how do you ensure that college is more affordable and accessible to all. Um, I think one of the processes right now for me is to watch, to assess what is the culture, figure out what is the appetite for change for projects. Um, and so as I do that, I'll be looking together with my uh, colleague librarians and faculty members to think about what are ways that together we can deepen um, our commitment to these values and make project, make progress with projects that will turn these visions into reality. We have made great strides at Trinity, and I'm very excited to see the next chapter that we will write together. I thank you for the opportunity to be here to share some of my experiences and my ideas, and I know I've already learned ideas that I hope I can take back and make my own journey more successful as a new president as I seek to advance Trinity University and our mission. So thank you so much.
Well, thank you again to the three speakers. Uh, let's throw things to the floor. Uh, any questions? Anybody would like? Hi, Dr. Anderson. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was actually commenting um, on social media about how wonderful it is to hear leadership kind of espousing all of the ideals that we keep so close to our hearts here. Um, and I mean, so much of what you're saying is, you know, what we feel here. Um, how would you recommend approaching someone who's heard all this and doesn't budge? <laughs> I, I always look for baby steps. Um, I, I would pick the thing that maybe is least threatening and ask them, would you try it and see what happens? Or would you let a group try it and see what happens? But I, I do think that um, when there's resistance, um, small nudges can often lead to bigger movements. Any further questions? From I, I certainly have a whole fistful here, but... Can I, well, can I start off with, with, with one anyway? One, one of the issues that came up a few times was changing the, changing the culture of research. And I think that that's something which um, maybe it would be nice to sort of articulate a little bit more. Certainly, we heard about changing the culture in, with open data. And uh, possibly some of the discussions about open data are, are, are threatening science threatening, challenging science more than open access did. Um, while in the humanities, it's the book, it's something there about the culture of research there as well. Um, and so I was just wanting to, and uh, you know, as, as a president, it's that culture of research which is fundamentally being altered here. And I, I just, I'm not quite sure what the question is, but how are you addressing, how are you engaging with that change in culture directly? Well, if you don't mind, I'm sorry. I think what we're really looking at is catching up with the technology and we, it's a wonderful thing to have tradition in, in, in academe and in, um, in, in inquiry, we have tradition and it's important and it's important to have things like the scientific method and replicable science, but we haven't really caught up with the technology of exactly what that means and how it changes how we work. And I've been involved with ETDs for nearly 20 years at this point. And when we started with that, you know, everybody did the plain vanilla, just basically, you know, making pictures of what they were typing, um, and didn't really utilize the the environment we had and the ability to show all kinds of things um, in terms of models and you know figures and that could do different things than we've ever done before. So I think we just kind of have to think we are no longer in the monastery illuminating a text, um, and that changed and went to the printing press. And you know we are now at a point of change, and I think everybody in this room is a change agent. Um, but that's hard um, to get that critical mass, and that's why what we're excited about and what we're finding with Data One is it does look like among scientists we're starting to approach a critical mass, and things will happen more quickly. Um, and I'll turn it over in terms of for humanists. Yeah, I mean, I think there are sort of two distinct issues within within humanities and social sciences, and some of them are just really around the culture of the book, and so less around promotion and assessment. And it's that attachment not just to print, but I think to sort of long-form content. And, you know, this comes back to the issues that I was talking about, about the challenges of licensing and the idea that if you spent five or six years carefully crafting every single word, that you're going to give that up to just whoever wants to reuse it and recombine it in different ways is just something that at this point is feels pretty unacceptable to, to the majority of authors in that field, in those fields. And then the second issue around promotion and tenure, I think, is, you know, somewhat more complicated and that sort of, you know, once you start looking at humanities as well, there are all the questions about, you know, not just books, but different forms of scholarships that are beginning to emerge in the digital age and the, the way in which those are going to be treated as well. And I think Danny made a good point when, you know, it's very easy to, for faculty to sort of look at institutions and say, you know, they need to change the way they do it. But essentially, the people who make up the promotion and tenure committees are faculty. And so they can choose to make those changes. And, you know, there are a small handful um, who are doing that at this point. Um, Mike Eisen, for example, has said that, you know, 
on his CV now, he no longer includes journal title. He includes author, title of the article, and DOI. Now, he may be able to get away with that, and maybe it's a little more difficult for his graduate students, but, you know, those the small changes are one thing sort of ground up, but I think it really does take sort of the kind of institutional level changes that Danny was talking about for it to be acceptable and safe for faculty to do that. I would say, think following on Allison's comment there, you know, my role in the past as a dean when I sat and presided over PNT, uh, and things would still go to a higher level, uh, but when you are sitting in a room with a group of faculty members and helping them evaluate the breadth of media and forms that scholarship can take and helping them feel confident about the nature of the evaluations, um, you know, ha having a, a good evaluation system by peers who are open to that multiplicity of formats is really crucial. Um, one of the comments that Allison made that, that really resonates with me also is that we are conflating a couple of issues. Uh, one of them is technology and the other is um, the, the issue of open, openness. Um, and I think that there, there are a lot of things that are not open, but technology is what is the concern of faculty members because it is changing the models in which you do things, in humanities at least, that if you're not interested in digital humanities, um, you may be in, in projects that just don't look like they make a lot of sense. Um, and so there, there, there are a lot of things like that that conversations, I think, are really crucial so that you can uh, clarify what some of the values are. And I'd like to add one other. One other point, on another project uh, beyond downloads um, that I've worked on, I've talked to many, many, many graduate students about their, their approach to scholarship and how they're doing scholarship. And it is really interesting to see the, as you were talking about, uh, Allison, the grassroots backwards because some of these students are talking about how their faculty are saying, how do you do that? Teach me how to do it. So some of tradition, is that people don't have the skill set. And that kind of showed up in our, in our educator survey. They know that the students need to learn about data management skills, but they don't have the material or the skill set to do so. Thank you very much. And I think we Yes, I have a question. Uh, my name is John Dove. I, I, I'm not an academic, but I come from uh, three generations of academic family. And across all different disciplines, humanities, social sciences, STEM. And I'd say that one thing that characterizes all of them is they're incredibly hardworking, they're modest, they're actually, I believe, of a service to humanity. But I'd have to say they didn't get to the level that they got to if they didn't have some prestige-seeking behavior, for sure. And so I wonder whether you could some way divide up the idea that prestige comes from submitting a journal to a, to a I mean, submitting an article to a journal that 90% of them get rejected. So that's why you want to get accepted there. And it, it separate the prestige aspect of that from the publishing aspect of it. So introduce some more awards and prestige and prestigious awards for really the best stuff that has been published in an open access venue. And that that would create some of the incentive and enthusiasm for not just their publication, but then it gets submitted and wins a prize. So get funding for some of those prizes. I wonder if that's been considered at all. Um. I'm not so much sure about the, the prizes, but I think you know the one point I did want to comment on there is that you raise an interesting point about the relationship between prestige and scarcity. And I think that's a real hangover from the print world. We, d we had a really interesting discussion just a couple of weeks ago with our faculty editorial committee about expanding Luminous. I mean, we, we're at a point now where we're starting to get a lot of proposals from authors who want to specifically publish under the Luminous program because of, they, uh, because of the digital and open qualities. The pushback we got was, well, you know, you don't want to publish too much as, you know, publishing more therefore means that some of it's going to be lesser quality. And I think what's really hard to get away from for a lot of faculty is um, this sense of they're part of an exclusive club if they get into that journal, if they get their book accepted by UC Press. And if we publish twice as many monographs, then somehow they're not a special anymore. And you know that really is a sort of cultural issue that is a, a tough one to, to get over. And I do think it sort of comes from the print paradigm and it doesn't really have a lot of relevance in the digital world. Just the... the I, I, recognition, I think, is really crucial. Um, and I, I don't know if an award, I think there, we, we need to think about ways to recognize 
what it is that we want people to do. And that might be another way to nudge uh, someone who is resistant is to develop some kind of award or prize that does incentivize some open access movement. I, and I thought that was a really insightful comment. I do think we're seeing it because people are looking at alt metrics, which is new ways to uh, acknowledge what the work. I think the definition of prestige has to change. Um, and I think millennials are kind of leading us on that because how millennials relate to the world through the through the web and through um, other kinds of technology and communication is telling us that there's a new way to be defined as being prestigious. And I think that's gonna slowly seep into how academe can, can think or should think in terms of giving recognition. Thank you, and I think we've got uh, what? I have a question for Edison. Uh, so uh, you mentioned several times that there's a little bit of resistance with the digital version of the book because people are still attached to paper. I actually think, think that there's a big challenge there because I think that the form factor of devices that we use to read ebooks are not very suited for you know the way researchers use books, so in a non-linear way. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if that uh, you can comment a little bit on how actually people have been consuming the book that you have been producing, if they are actually asking for the paper copy or they're using the open access uh, version available online. So if there's any anything that you can say about that. Yeah. Sure. Well, I think, you know, one of the things that's been interesting is the number of print copies that we have sold, and I sort of shared some of that data. That said, you know, the number of downloads we've had are sort of more than 10 times the number of print sales. So we are making available all digital forms at this point. So, you know, we've got EPUB, we've got PDF, and, and so on. 60% of the downloads are PDF, so there's clearly, at least at this point, a preference for PDF. I think the issue is, you know, when you look at all of the faculty surveys and the way in which people use long-form content, most faculty will say that they would rather have both versions because the digital is useful in certain use cases, but in cases where people are reading a substantial portion of a book or the whole book, they would rather read print. So I think there really is a role for both. One of the other aspects that I think is interesting about um, the Luminous program is that we, you know, the platform is able to accommodate multimedia. So we haven't published that many titles at this point that have really taken advantage of that. But we can include an additional to um, an endless number of still in color images, um, moving image, sound, and so on. You then get to a point where the digital version becomes the version of record because the print is unable to fully replicate the digital version. And so it's sort of early days. But I think, again, when you're sort of thinking of the version of record of a book, there are some books that are now moving in the direction that instead of P plus E, it's becoming E plus P, and P doesn't quite equal E anymore. I, I would okay. agree with that. The, the thing that I find interesting, my, back, my, background, is it, my background is as a scholar of Mexican literature, um, and I work on projects in history of publishing, history of the book, and I can produce things that won't fit in a print format because I need to have access to a database and someone needs to be able to sort it to understand the things that I want to analyze. Um, but it, you know, it's really interesting in that the PDF um, digital still doesn't solve my problem. So. Okay, well, I think uh, we're at the end of our time now. So could I just uh, thank all three speakers very much indeed.